Welcome to the Ankh-Morpork Historian's Guild. Today, we will be drunkenly reviewing Interesting Times by Terry Pratchett. My name is Pertis, and I use they-them pronouns. Um, my name is Mulch. I also use they-them pronouns. I'm uh, Geo. I'm the token cis person here. Uh, I use she-her pronouns. Yes. Imagine yes. being cis. So, as you've already picked up, we are <laughs> oh. doing this episode drunk. Rincewind is a piece of shit, and first, this book is racist. First? It's the first, worst first? book. I, want I can make... guarantee that this is the worst book no. ever. All right. I want to bring up a simple fact. We are currently recording this on 9-11. As it should be. Merry Christmas, boys. In 11, to all who celebrate. Um, I, let, that was not a... Uh, okay, yeah, let's, sure. let's start with, <laughs> what are each of you drinking? Um, I'm drinking rum and Coke. Um, yes. It's, it's rum. Yes. <laughs> that was the most sober way I could have said that. Yeah, you guys are doing great. They, uh, for, for the listeners' benefit, they pre-gamed without me. Uh, I didn't know I was supposed to come in drunk, so I'm currently sober. I'm making myself a drink right now. Uh, I am doing a little seasonal winter wassail punch yeah. with vodka wait, wait. and some winter savory from my backyard. Fancy. Woo. Fancy. Well, I'm not going to fucking like... drink a rum and coke. I'm gay I feel for like a reason. You're the... You're the only one who knows how to do alcohol out of us. I guess Michi kind of does. I don't know how to do alcohol. I it's hate true. alcohol. Kind I of hate do it. know how to do alcohol. Just like, it's... just to realize that I prefer highballs to real cocktails, so I just drink those instead. Yeah. We just finished drinking a truly disgusting drink, which is like squirt I, and I vodka did... mixed with pop rocks. Pop rocks? What the it was fuck? Really foul. Did you really drink that? <laughs> that sounds. I want to put pop rock. I want to put pop rocks in my drinks. I think the theory is sound. I'm currently now drinking a ginger ale with vodka mixed with strawberry pop rocks, and it's a lot better. I just think like punch pop rocks and, and um squirt. Squirt was just like a really bad combination. I want you to stop drinking like a high schooler. Oh. That's what I want. I think you'd like it better if you stop <laughs> drinking like a high schooler. Um, can it's true. I'm hear... drinking like a 16 year old right now. Yeah, it's like next year you're gonna be like, I'm pouring shots of Fireball. You all ready? Um, Fireball is a little too disgusting for me. So um, we should talk about why we're drunk for this episode, right? I mean, let's talk about the book. Because... Let's talk about it. I wanted to say what we're drinking. Yeah, and and yeah, I'll put in some disclaimers because we're 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 just gonna say that this book is pretty racist, and we're going to complain about it, but we're not going to be the most intelligent. So I'm I'm starting sober so that I can say, the Chinese government definitely did bad things, and satirizing governments is good and right and proper. However, whenever you satirize something and you include people, you fall risk to playing into other things. This book very much does that by playing into yellow peril in its descriptions of almost every single Asian character in this book. Or uh, Oriental, as, as the book notes. Um, every, every person yeah, we meet is um, super submissive, uh, except for the scheming vizier, who is wildly competent, which is a classic... All of this is, is classic yellow peril. The idea that there is a supreme force out there to get you, made out of terrible, stupid citizens, and mastermind scheming evil kings. Or emperors, in fact, if you really want. <laughs> entire book titled Eastern, Eastern Despotism, which was entirely built on the premise that in countries were more prone to despotism and just like the people in them were inherently more submissive and more um, culturally inclined to blindly follow despotic leaders. Yes. This the book, the book was, was actually called um, Oriental Despotism. 
Fuck, I knew it was either Eastern or Oriental. I just couldn't remember which. Yes. Yeah, um, I thought about that, like, a lot while reading this book. Yeah, I mean, the thing is very upsetting to see Terry Pratchett, who is just such, so good at characterization, completely fail to, like, competently char characterize one character that he is portraying as Asian. Like, that was horrific. That was horrible. Yeah. Like, he, none of them are people. Like, and they are, yeah, they, yeah, it's very frustrating. Yes. Uh, he actively made two flower worse, which I'm mad about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were just, there were a lot of levels to it. The book, the book, like, we cannot sum up all of the history of Yellow Peril, which is part of why we're drunk for this. We are yeah. not, um, you know, going to do the best job of that. If you are listening to us talk and you are asking yourself, well, I don't think it's racist. I don't think it's this. I don't think it's that. I implore you to look into the history of the Yellow Peril, the way that that propaganda infected, especially Britain and America, but all throughout the West, and how this book, incidentally or not, plays into them. I don't believe that Terry Pratchett was sitting around like, oh, I hate the Chinese. Like, I don't think he was doing that. But whenever you seek to make fun of something and whenever you generalize all people, you play, you, you could potentially play into racist narratives or racist myths. You are no longer in the heart of satirism. You are now um, in the heart of spreading pop propaganda. The line is, is, is very, very thin. Yeah. Um, Another thing that is um, pretty obnoxious is that while it's primarily a parody of Imperial China, it's kind of like a lot of Eastern Asian countries bunched together. Like, there is a lot of, like, Japanese. What do there. you mean, Shogun? Uh, <laughs> God. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's rough. He does that thing that he does actually a lot, which is that like Discworld areas become just general areas of the world, which can be uh, well on edge most of the time, anyways. But um, especially when he's using real life words or uh, systems <laughs> from the real yeah. world, gets increasingly, increasingly sketch. Yeah. I will note, speaking of the Yellow Peril specifically, it is worth noting that the Grand Vizier's plan is to invade the Western world. He wants, his endgame is to invade Ink Morpork. Yeah. Not only is, again, his, like, not only is his endgame to invade uh, Ink Morpork, but he's obsessed with dressing up as Ink Morporkian. Like, he believes they're better than his own people and that he should rule them. Oh, yeah. Which is itself also classic to Yellow Peril. This idea that there are anybody who is there and is competent wants to be us and wants to take us over to be us and is yes. secretly envious of our finer nation. That is. Yeah, this whole book <laughs> was yeah. how much better shitty Britain is to, to imperialist China. Like, like it, it, it was all about. Like, uh, like the whole like oh, oh but we're free narrative uh, uh, compared to like these docile people who like you know they they have something worse than whips you know they they just magically the mind like shit. have this yeah have this god no yeah like he 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 wants to it feels like he wants to paint this idea of like how nations subjugate us, which is a thing that happens. Nations can subjugate their people under ideologies. But because he does not actually show how that occurs in any real way outside of the direct palace, uh, it just comes across as, as all of these people he... being naturally submissive. Yeah. I also don't just, I don't think he understands Eastern Asia or hmm. Eastern Asian countries or how they work. I mean, he was never, he never went in his entire like, life, so. Yeah, I, yeah. has he been <laughs> an ancient Asian person, like, just in general? Like, ever? 
Uh, yeah, and like again, I do want to be like totally fucking clear. Chinese government, Cold War, nineteen ninety five. Hey, not great. Um, lots of bad things happening. But the problem arises when he characterizes all people as this thing, and he guesses at the reasons why based on the general personality of all people in that city. It is exactly what you mentioned with the Oriental Despotism book, the idea that like East Asian people are just submissive and just give in. This is most clearly painted in the book with the idea that even those who have seen through the veil, as it were, and are protesting are incapable of correctly and actually doing it. They think that yeah. bullshit ass anthems. Yes, that is a big thing. Yeah, they 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 equate bullshit ass anthems and weird shit like that with the greatest thing they could do. And this idea that for them to actually do anything, they do need the vizier to guide their path and basically force them into doing it. And that there are also only like 20 people who are okay with this, and most of them are children. <laughs> For no apparent reason, he has, he has made the bold choice that they are recruited child soldiers. <laughs> um, yeah. And there's only like 20 people in the revolution. And it's like, it's just, it's like spitting on all of the real revolutionaries in China who do like amazing work. Uh, <laughs> like, there are mass scale protests in you know it's just it's yeah. just bullshit i yeah like the the idea <laughs> that especially in 1995 1994 the idea that there there weren't all these people doing doing so much trying to change things it, it, it's oh yeah the the idea that there haven't been real power struggles and real things is is insulting and um you know yeah it's right, like, this is, it's especially insulting when, when this is a man who can look at reports about Tiananmen Square, which would have happened just a couple of years ago, um, or um, a lot of other protests that happened under Dengue. Um, there are also... It's, it's insulting. Just, it's like, really insulting. a lot of um, moments inside of this book. Like, there are points that really reminded me of Harry Potter in a bad way. As an example, here's this quote, uh, which is, the best thing you can do if the peasants is leave them alone. Let them get on with it. When people who can read and write start fighting on the people, on the behalf of people who can't, you just end up with another kind of stupidity. If you want to help them, build a big library or something somewhere and leave the door open. Yeah. Basically... Yeah. Do you see what I mean when I describe that as a British moment? Little British moment. Yeah, there are things like this, and the, it's just there are so many levels that are like he's he's just not getting this thing. He's not getting this to struggle with these people, and for all for all the things that make me upset about this book, I should specify that the reason it makes me so powerfully upset, and the reason he's reaching these levels is because despite all this, he is still an incredibly clever writer. He's an incredibly clever person. And there are so many little bits and pieces of this that are incredible. Like, really funny little moments. Um, it's just that they are fucking swamped in so much racism that my mind was sliding off of this book <laughs> like water off a duck's back. Like... It is because of his skill in writing that this came across as so vehemently racist, um, and and so artfully so. God, oh, that's a, yeah. That's just... I guess and the thing so... about it, the thing about it that really gets to me, is that it is coherently thematically racist. Most, yeah, and that's there are a lot of books from this era that are racist. But this one is so coherent in its racism, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. And like, and the thing with this book is, compared to the, like, his writing, the, the best part of his writing is the overreaching, like, like, message and themes and like, the, the overreaching feel from it and what it says about the world is normally the best part of his books. And the fact that yeah. it is the very worst part of this book is so 
disappointing. Like his writing is competent. Like even, you know, I think the Rincewind books are the worst and the boringest. And like I, I was bored during this book too because there's a lot of like Rincewind just encountering things that upset him over and over again or like are trying to kill him over and over again. And I, I got bored of that. But he is a competent writer. And but he has competently created this huge thematic like like overall message of just being just ah uh, just yeah i'm uh, sorry i'm 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 drunk so i'm more uh worked up than i normally would be i'm i'm, I'm no i'm i'm actually thinking you. No. yeah I was, I was about to say i think we might actually need to do more drunk episodes cuz usually you don't talk very much uh <laughs> I'm so pissed off. I'm so angry. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be impossible for us to go through every little thing that makes this book racist. I mean, it's like there there are so many parts. Uh, from from the name of uh, Two Flowers' daughter being pretty butterfly, to the fact it. that oh, do you know further why? Because it's also no, in, uh, so so it works on. Two levels. One, butterflies keep messing up his life in this. That's a joke with Lady Luck. But also, there's yeah. a very famous opera called Madame Butterfly. Uh, an Italian 1887 produced uh, opera called Madame Butterfly. So that's cool. Um, what's it? Is it? I mean, hey, it's an 1887 like the, Italian. What's it about? <laughs> Is the iconic like orientalist like? Yeah. See, that's where I thought and... we were going with that, but I just wanted to make sure. Uh oh, I'm so sorry. And I looked it up I'm to try too and double drunk check to explain the Madame Bl Butterfly archetype. No, I yeah, it, but it is it's very classic. It's very famous. Um, it's it's classic it's like, like oriental fantasy... geisha type shit. Like it's like. Fantasy no. of a submissive Asian girlfriend lover yeah. person. And and Pretty Butterfly, I hated every scene with Pretty Butterfly. Because, like, she is returning to Terry Pratchett's first few books of, like, just the violent, unreasonable woman who has no characterization and is just... And then, like, and then her whole, her overreaching, like... She's presented as, like, smart and competent or whatever, sort of, but, like, then her overreaching, like, mixing ideas up. are so stupid. I think stupid. you're mixing up the two daughters. Yeah. I think you're mixing up the two daughters. There's, um... There's Pretty Butterfly. Pretty Butterfly is the quiet, submissive one, and then the other one is No, Pretty the Butterfly is the one violent who's one. Presented... Pretty Butterfly is the violent one. Hey. I just listened to this. Okay, who's the other one? Who's <laughs> uh, the that's other one? Lotus Flower or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot her name. Yep. She's, yeah. She's not really there. Yeah. So yeah. Pretty Butterfly is the one that causes problems. She absolutely falls into what Mulch is talking about. This classic character that Terry Pratchett has of woman who's truly violent and kind of competent, and for some reason puts up with Rincewind instead of just killing him. Um, yeah. And it's her characterization is really poor, but it is incredible to note that she has maybe the best characterization of any of the Asian characters. Um, which is so pathetic. <laughs> yeah, pathetic. Because at the very least, her basic motivation makes sense. She actually does want revolution. She wants things to change, and she thinks they're bad, which is correct. Um. But that's it. And like she does it in the stupidest way. So she needs this white savior, pathetic little man to come and fix things for for them. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's also worth noting that this is a super fucking imperialist book. Like it, um, like it is worth noting that they stress over and over how impossible. It is for Asian people to lead their own revolution. And how, in the end, the person who ends up reforming and taking over the country 
is a Western foreigner who like basically scuttles and replaces every aspect of their culture. And it's specifically it's Cohen the Barbarian. Positive. Yeah. Cohen the Barbarian ends up as the Emperor Savior. A man literally deranged, incapable of any long-term thought, who is 97 in this book, and backed only by a single tax man. So, yeah. I don't know what yeah. the fuck that is. <laughs> it's very explicitly imperialist. Very normal. Very cool. Love it. I might kill someone. It's... it. There is a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot in this book. Oh, by the way, by the way, I remember you two doubting me when I said that this was easily the worst Discworld book. So, oh, yeah. I feel yeah, I like did doubt you, and I was wrong. I, I need to at I least do a wrong. little bit. I needed to do at least a little bit of like a victory lap on uh, audio here. Yeah, I, you I, were. I was wrong. So and I'm woo. so sorry. Yeah, so so for reference, I love you. <laughs> for reference, everybody, we haven't done an episode in a long time, and um, so I've had to listen to this book twice now because <laughs> it was so long. Yeah, me too. Uh, I am. Yes, I am. I, I did too. I didn't listen to all of it, but I listened to too much of it again. And this with the book new recording truly sucks shit. Um, review of the new recording since we're here. Um, the character voices that he does for both Rincewind and Cohen are um, unfucking bearable, which really adds a lot to their characters um, as you know, nearly completely insufferable people. Um, I don't like the new death voice at all. Um, I think it is. Shoot, I forgot to go listen to that. Oh my god, yeah, I think it's way too like. Grim, dark, weird. I don't think it matched at all. I uh, I really didn't like it. Um, I'm interested to see how that voice will perform in a death-centered book. But um, we yeah. will see. I don't have great hopes. Um, yeah. I think the rest of it was... I think it was very high quality. The main narrator, whose name I've forgotten. Uh, the main narrator does a good job. Uh, if... Um, if a little, a little bit of difficulty adjusting to the new voices, having listened to so many mm -hmm. of what? What's the other guy's name? Oh. Uh, Nigel Ni something something. Nigel He's... Planner. Planner. Yes, Nigel Planner. Yeah, Ni Nigel Planner. Oh. Um. Yeah. No. I I felt that same adjustment. I liked Rincewind's voice better because it felt like it fit the character better. It made me hate him um, even more, which is an incredible and feat. I. L I loved the how the footnotes were done. I don't think like that's what I've missed the most about reading the like physical books is the footnotes, and they did a great job of like expressing it through audio. Yeah. So specifically sure. to to give how they do the footnotes, uh, they put a little dazzle on it, and then Bill Nye reads the footnotes instead of <gasps> that's oh, Bill Nye. Nice. Not Bill, Bill Nye, Nye of Science Guy, Bill Nye of oh. uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, you got Wait, my hope. I, know, I also know that guy. I used to get really confused because yeah. I was like, wait, that uh, Nye's appearance sure has changed a lot. Bill I, Nye of I, Slarty Bartfist from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, anyways... The main reader is Colin Morgan of BBC's Merlin. Um, also a bunch of other stuff, but hey, BBC's Merlin. It's honestly not yeah. good, but he does a good job in it. Um, yeah. I, I, do, <laughs> I do sometimes wish that they had given more roles to, like, more voice actors. Uh, let me be clear that Colin Morgan has done other readings, but I would hardly say it's his main career. Um, Bill Nye, I don't mind. He's a professional voice actor at this point. Um, but, um, I think he did a, a pretty solid job. Yeah. And the footnotes, uh, the way the footnotes I... work is great. It gives that space, that comedic timing that was really hard to replicate, um, elsewise. 
I mean, a kissy well, nose. Note, you care that. I am the one person here who has not listened to uh, the new Interesting Times audiobook because um, you refuse uh, to spend money on it, which is reasonable die. and good. Yeah. I would rather die than spend money on uh, Interesting Times. I mean, it I, just goes I to Rihanna, it doesn't it? Is that her name? Rhiannon, right? Oh. Musical person? Oh, his, uh, daughter. his daughter. <laughs> his oh, daughter. okay. I was like, what? Uh, Rihanna? Um, I think it's Rhiannon. I think her, might, her name might be Rhiannon Pratchett. Yeah, I think it's Rhiannon. Oh. This is totally unrelated, and I am drunk. Uh, the Discworld Emporium website updated. It looks nice. Shit. Oh, just it was awesome. not. Yeah, this is a shout out to the Discworld Emporium, the official Ankmore Pork seller and official vendor of Ankmore Pork stamps, operating and owned in the UK. Um, they have a really it's nice website that happens. Uh, yeah, they ship to it. Um, I. I love Discworld Emporium. They happen to it. chronologically list all of the books, so I often use it to know what book we're reading next. Yes. Oh, I just use Wikipedia. I should get a necklace from them. They have a bunch or of cool socks. stuff. They have um, socks. Notably, uh, you should be listening to the new recording for the next book we read, Masquerade, as its new version has already released. Oh, sweet. I will do hmm. that. I think Dev has right. a larger presence love... in Masquerade, as I recall. So we'll see how you guys feel about the I... Death Voice. I really don't like it. I really, I think it's bad, actually. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is like, same reader. I know how to get basically all of the Discworld audiobooks for free. So there's part of me that's like, I am interested in listening to the new audiobooks, especially yeah. since they do the uh, footnotes better. But also, I'm like, I guess I'll just see how financially stable I am yeah, in the I was upcoming. About to say. Not to be yeah, a raging yeah. leftist, but we'll see if you have a job. <laughs> I mean, or I whatever. have a job. Yeah, it's true. It's just like, all my money is like, in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, and I gotta get them to like, get it to me. I can drive you there if you uh, want. Yeah, but you can't be is the one bad thing. Is that I, at like an unreasonable hour, I need to start work at seven. The office, and I end work at two, and the office closes at three. And can you not get there? So, yeah. like, I. What amount don't of time know. can you drive there from? Again, like, like from I did work. said it was, say it was like, check, but it is like, again, but fuck nowhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have to we have to review this book. We do. Okay. <laughs> we we have to I, review this. Stay focused, team. Okay. Um, Rat let's talk about let's talk culture. about some good things. Let's talk about some good things. I'm tired of looking at bad things. Uh, you should get that rat cut apron. You yeah, should I should. Rat cut apron. I was looking on Discworld Emporium, and they they have cool stuff, and I like it. Yeah, they have um, absolutely dope stuff. If is, anybody truly loves is, me, if anybody, hey, if anybody truly loves me, get me every single Discworld book in the Collector's Library Edition. Because I love the front art for the Collector's Library Editions. I really do. Um, uh, I think that would be close to $300, but um, nope, my math is wrong. $500, oh, shit. but they are sick. Um, They've got a fancy special edition of Amazing Maurice and his Educated Rodents. Uh, yeah, they have a special edition nice. of everything. Looks killer. Looks killer. I would love to have this set, but $500. Yeah. Um, $500. We're going to talk about some good stuff. I'm going to talk about some good stuff. You guys aren't required to. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, yeah. Hate, I hate. I have the willpower. There's some things that are good, right? Like, I think that at this point, he's really pinned it down. Kind of what I want the um, the wizards to be in the books where they exist. They're just like a bunch of shitty, bumbling old fools who appear for a while um, and through basically random needless means make incredible things occur. They also yeah. do techno magic. <laughs> uh, and we finally pin that down with Hex's like... 
Hex is like semi sentient now, and he's really doing calculations. This isn't his first appearance, as we covered before, but this is his first, like, I would say fully operational appearance. This is the first time where they really hone in on that Hex is this way, and that giving him a name gives him power, and that he's a he, even. It's really interesting and exciting to see Terry Pratchett do this, as Terry Pratchett was a tech evangelist for his time, especially for an older man. He was uh, deeply into computers and deeply excited by them. Um, his yeah. own home I... was wired the fuck up with a bunch of computers, very famously. Uh, and he was also way into yeah. the Elder Scrolls series. Even Absolutely all the way... Even way, uh, even way back in, like... Um... Like fantastic. He was talking about computers and the potential of computers. Yeah. No, no, his I work. love I do love Hex, and I think the wizards bugged me a lot less than they normally do in his books. Um, and I do love like the techno magic thing. Um he I like the young nerdy wizard a lot. Ponder Stibbins. Yeah. Ponder Stibbins, yeah. And Ponder I would Stibbins kiss I would kiss Ponder Stibbins. I love that. Honestly. Dude. Um honestly. Uh he uh and Terry Pratchett also had like a mod made for elder scrolls right when he when he was um uh wow what what did he have he had <laughs> fucking I'm, I'm yeah he he had the thing and he got a bot and it was cool that's it good night <laughs> um Terry Pratchett was suffering from memory degeneration from uh, Alzheimer's. Al Alzheimer's, yes. And he partnered up with another person to program their companion so that it could lead him to areas, basically so he could follow the person around if given an instruction, like go to the next meeting point or something, and that she would lead them around the world um, as he was having trouble keeping his mind clear enough to to follow the path, essentially. Yeah. Must have um, been hell. Yes, Alzheimer's for, is like, not great. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was it was it was not a nice time. Um but yeah, so he put that together. He also actually helped work I on the I do some have other ones. a thing that I like about this book. Yeah, what is it? I like the love luggage oh good i knew you were gonna say it the luggage fuck. the luggage fuck. i also thought i was gonna say that it's the best we get luggage. baby luggages and then he abandons his family to go with rincewind which is the poorest decision he has ever made i mean you know it's like a used dog i feel so bad for the luggage the luggage I mean, deserves better Justice I, uh, for the luggage. I think the luggage is, you know, really the decider in this experience. I don't feel bad. It, he does seem to want to be here. I guess. I, I guess. Uh, Rincewind basically <sighs> does nothing to him. Um, it, it, it's he a good. Kicks good him song. a lot. It's rude. It's rude. <laughs> I'm... Uh, I'm... Yeah. Okay. Hey, do you guys like want to <laughs> do a podcast or whatever? Oh yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about this no, stupid <laughs> fucking book that I'm gonna pee on. Yeah. Oh, you're I gonna own, piss on I the book? Think, I think I own it. Yeah, I think I can pee. On it. Yeah, definitely. Oh, editing I've mentioned book. on previous episodes, but this is the one book that I cannot listen to without headphones, simply because I'm so scared that my dad will walk in and like hear me listening to the most racist shit he's heard in his life. <laughs> Yeah, specifically racist against him. Like, I was about to say, I don't yeah. think that it's possible that this is the most racist thing he's heard in his life, but probably not no, great. No, probably not. <laughs> from He's from... He, came, he first came to America in the 80s, during which there was specifically like anti-Asian racism against Jap Japanese people, very specifically. Yeah, um, he's... Like, people used to, like... Uh, like roll um used to slow down their cars as he was passing by and like shout uh go back china man shit like that yeah yeah i'm sure he's had an incredibly normal time of it just in general yeah. i mean it is i will say pretty normal but um 
this would be oh, the bad well, thing yes, about it. Like, yes, uh, that's true. That was an improper phrase. <laughs> but like, just just in the way that normal time of it means mentally ill time of it, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, You're showing yeah, your tumblers. He did not love. He did not love the eighties. They were not a good time. Uh, okay. Um, so this book. Yeah, this fucking book team. Uh. This is going to be our shortest episode ever because you all just get like way too drunk to keep going. Yeah, but yeah. we can talk more about this book. It's talk, also talk, worth talk. noting that so I don't... audiobook for interesting times twice. Uh, I did not re-listen to it for the second one. I just went through, did a keyword search and took like specific notes of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I don't like Rincewind, I, I think it's very funny that Rincewind is now mashed potatoes only for Horny, but I don't like that he was horny for Two Flowers' daughter, and I, I don't I don't like it. I think it's bad. But it is funny that we hear about mashed potatoes instead of his cock. I, I do like, like not hearing about Rincewind. Do you prefer that? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I do think it's funny, this idea that Rincewind has like transmuted his horniness into like hunger uh, and they've become indistinguishable to him that is very very funny to me there are some funny parts in this book like yeah i'll totally yeah. give it to this book there are some funny parts there are some incredibly funny things it's just that there's all the other bit of the book around them. <laughs> yeah yeah what is so the teacher um, this is oh my god let's talk about teach team yeah let's talk about teach how do we feel about Teach? Like, in some ways, he was like his own brand of racist, but in some ways he was less racist than the other ones. And he just fu- got fucking killed for no reason. Like, there's no reason to kill him. He does. Him. Get killed for no reason. I really like Teach. I think that mm-hmm. he's a great character. You're right that he, like, has this kind of, like, the thing where you're racist by being really excited but like thinking that they're better in every way right like yeah, uh, yeah. we're americans we see is... we see people do this for native americans all the time yeah the, um the, the noble whole, like, savage yeah the whole like uh chest is the way into the oriental mind yeah uh yeah um but he is like a great character his his whole concept the idea that there is a teacher who basically bumped into a horde of barbarians and was like, man, this seems like a better life. And then fucking dips. Quality. Yeah, as, as someone who is going to school specifically to be a teacher, I agree with him. I don't know why I'm doing this. Um, it's a bad choice. I would but, say that you know, ma- many of the best scenes in the book are related to or because of him. Um, like I loved the moment where he starts raging like a barbarian, thinking about school teacher, like headmasters and gym teachers, and whatnot. Fucking hilarious stuff like that. Yeah, that's so solid. Valid. I feel like a lot of teachers have wills of untapped rage. I do too. It's just you gotta yeah. suppress it so hard at work. Yeah, I will say you I've know? had many teachers who did not. <laughs> Yes. Which, which is not great either. Like, um, no, I'm I'm so cheerful and energetic at work. So cheerful and energetic. I will say you're also cheerful and energetic basically everywhere else. So it may be a more good career. More energetic. Are like it could be a good career. More energetic by so much. Fuck. You're like an S tier user of rage suppression. Yes. So I am. I am. But like. But you like, could be Catholic at this point. So, has anyone heard about, has, does anyone know what Ublek is? Oh, I love Ublek. Yeah, I love Ublek. It's, it's a, uh, and then they raise their hands and they tell me all they know. And normally they know that it's a liquid and a solid. And I'm like, yes, exactly. It is a non-Newtonian fluid. Great job. I love you. Um, and then I explain that a non-Newtonian fluid and quicksand and ketchup. 
and it's that's my favorite spiel for the projects. Is ketchup it's a the, non-Newtonian fluid? It is. If you, it's not. It doesn't behave like oobleck, but if you hit the back of the bottle, it will slow it down. Like one of those old glass bottles, it'll slow it down because you are applying force, and it is a non-Newtonian fluid because force makes it slower. Just that's not solid. Like if you, yeah, if you punch it, it'll still like splatter everywhere. Not like oobleck, but it is a non-Newtonian fluid technically. That is really peculiar. I didn't know that. Well, that's exciting yeah. to know. Yeah. I have spiels for every every science project, and they're so fun. And, like, the kids get into them, which is nice. Hang on. This is totally unrelated, but it's just hitting me that Anne Hathaway is kind of hot. Okay. We cannot. <laughs> we cannot. We cannot. You fucking, you fucking lesbian. What are you fucking talking okay, about? Okay. You just realized Anne Hathaway is hot? Okay, to be fair, I just saw I'm buying you a therapist right now. The <laughs> oh, I bought I Avery as a therapist. Oh, shoot. Oh, yeah, that was good. Are you scrolling Twitter during okay, our podcast? Um, you do have ADHD, so that does make sense. Are you scrolling Twitter during your podcast? today. Okay, I stopped. I stopped. I'm sorry. You're you're unmedicated right now. What the fuck are you talking about? You can't. Yeah, take some so meth, idiot. Not, I did not take my Adderall today. Okay, but you you um, have Adderall. That's the important part. Yeah, don't take I it with. Do you have with, Adderall? Don't. Yeah, don't try to take it with I mean, I can, alcohol. But like, still. I can't. I can't take it with alcohol. I just like to skip at least one day a week so I don't become uh, too acclimated to it because if I take too much Adderall my experience if I just like allow myself to gradually up the dose at some point it'll stop working as Adderall and I'll just start getting negative side effects like jitteriness um, a nausea etc. I'm going to switch to non-stimulant like ADHD meds, which I'm excited about, actually. I want yeah. non-stimulant ADHD meds. Yeah. It's um, my favorite book. Sorry, guys. I, I'll cut most, <laughs> some of this out. Uh, but I, think this is gonna, I think this is going to be our shortest episode. I think this is going to be the shortest episode. We're, That's we're true. Gonna, I don't... We're going to record for an hour and a half. 30 minutes of it is going to be usable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't don't have a lot to say about it. No, I mean that's why we're doing it. Um, ooh, ooh, yeah. ooh! I did want to say this: of all yeah. the racisms that exist in this book, the one that really bothered me is the fact that most of the time the dialogue is occurring in what is the name of the language? Agatian. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the language of the Orient is most of the dialogue occurs in that language that is to do with the um with the asian characters and they still mostly speak a version of broken english i know right like including like oh yeah including yeah, own yeah. fucking language the hyper competent emperor character um he knows ink morporkian and most of his dialogue occurs in his own language. He also speaks a form of broken English. Um, very cool. Just to like really nail down that this book is racist. I just wanted I gotta, to mention that. I gotta check if I have this book so I can pee on it. <laughs> and then set it on fire. Uh, you might want to let it dry first. Or set it on fire and then pee on it. No, no. I'm sending it. I'm putting it in a big on fire. It. Because then it won't matter that I peed on it. Because it's a big fire. It'll just okay. send it smoke. Okay. I'm not smoke. I'm just gotcha. Kidding. You've got a plan. That's, I have that's a, good. such a fucking good plan. I'm so cool at all times. You are so cool <laughs> at all times. Okay. So I will note that this is... Um, we have two more Rincewind books. Like, two more legit Rincewind books. <laughs> Why? I thought there was only four. Um, basically, the <laughs> Well, there, there is... No. One of them, one of them's, um, isn't one of them the, like, illustrated comic-y one? Please tell me one of them. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I mean, it has illustration. 
it has illustrations, but it's still like 10 hours text only. <laughs> uh, are you still there? Are okay, still I'm so okay. sad. What's, so we, we've got Jingo in the last continent, right? No, Jingo doesn't have Jingo. Him. Yeah, Jingo's it's the, a watch the last book. continent and the last um, last hero, I think. Yeah, the last hero. Mainly Conan focused. Conan focused. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, oh you said you said the wrong the name. We're fucking DMC eight. Um, <laughs> oh, no, nah, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, it's it's the last Conan, era. the Conan estate. People are fucking fell. Like, uh, um, true. You know, case closed. Japanese title for that is Detective Conan, and it's named specifically after Conan Doyle. Like the fucking Conan, the barbarian people put out a fucking. DM, like basically put out a copyright claim and they had to change it to case closed. That's really funny. I mean, it's, it's terrible, fucking bullshit, it dude. It's like you know bullshit. what you know what we have before the next Discworld book. A good feet book? of clay. Feet of clay. We have feet, feet of, of clay, clay before the next. Bangs. God, I don't even. I haven't even listened to the full version, but I'm ready. I'm ready to. Okay, I so, just double checked. The I, Last Hero is 160 pages total with all of its illustrations. It's 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 not very long. Okay, good, good. It, um, that one. Okay, good. It, and it, good. it it is very comic-y. I just double checked. Like it's it's pretty. It's a lot of illustrations and a lot of like large text around illustrations. It looks kind of weird, but. Um, I remember this book well, actually. Because it gets into some cool stuff. Okay, so the thing about... Yeah. So the thing about um, Continent, it's not as aggressively racist as Interesting Times, so it has that going for it. I mean, that would be literally um, impossible, so... But it is the most boring Discworld book. Like, the one with the fewest ideas. Oh. It just, it doesn't feel like a book that needs to exist. Oh, it's the Australian one. The Australia one. Right. I have, like, I think I did actually read this book, but nothing really happens. <laughs> so it's okay. Yeah. I Is there anything else to say about this book? Like... I like mean, Conan like invades the palace, and that's you know we have said so much on Rincewind, and we've already said so much on Cohen. They are his original characters. They've evolved. They're different. He really plays up more of the aspects of the gods playing a game, and I think that that's really cool. And I think that the way he will continue to use gods, especially in this next section of books, is pretty cool. Um, but I've said that every fucking time. I just want Rincewind to fucking die. Actually he's die. He's not going to. I know he, that like, he doesn't. He, like, literally never dies. He gets a nice retirement with I mean, the I mean, like, his whole thing is that it's basically imp impossible to kill him, so. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It sucks. Okay. This book sucks. This book sucks, don't read this book. Uh. Save yourself. We should probably rank it. It is super yeah, what easy. You, oh, yeah, let it's me rank it. Bottom. <laughs> it's dead Bottom. last. Fuck dead this last. book. It's the worst. This book sucks shit. Um, I, I can't believe it. We found something worse than sorcery. It's another Rincewind book. <laughs> We knew this. Putting knew this. the bottom of my list is every Rincewind book. <laughs> yes. Um, um, I have books at the bottom that are not Rincewind. I mean, you put equal yeah, well, rights. You liked uh, sorcery. You liked sorcery more than any. No, 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 no. Light fantastic. Light fantastic. Nobody likes sorcery. Oh no, shit! Light, light fantastic. That's what I meant. I mean, yeah. I did um, like sorcery the most of the three of us, but it is still too. like very me close too. to the bottom of the list. I mean, exactly. and yeah, you you hate equal rights, so. Yes, which makes sense to me. I understand. Oh, the, I liked right. it more than yeah. you did. Okay, you know, what, I understand. what's it's this not fucking book called? Interesting. Books. 
Yeah, Masquerade yes. is next, which I actually am excited for. I think we're really getting into the era Masquerade of... Masquerade is pretty interesting, yeah. Discworld books that I really enjoyed. Um, we're really... We're, we're, we're fucking getting there, team. We're almost really there. For me, we've been in that era for a while. Like, ever since Guard Guards. Guards Guards. Um, I really liked his later stuff a, a lot more. It's It's much more what I prefer. Um, so this first yeah. era, this first era was really rough for me. <laughs> there were forty one books, mean, um, and we're we're yeah. there now. I'd we're consider in. like men at, I'd consider guards, guards, and men at arms to be some of my favorites, along with small gods. Uh, yeah, for uh, me, I uh, like if we're talking watch books, Night Watch and Thud are um, fucking genius. And Stand to Me is still my favorite watch books. Though I love Men at Arms and Guards Guards. Yeah. I prefer Men at Arms to Night Watch, though I do like Night Watch a lot. Yeah, I'm really excited to hit Night Watch in a, uh, two or three years. Yeah, me too. Um, Masquerade, yeah, though. Yeah, it's going to be ages. Masquerade takes place in Ankhmore Pork. It's the first time we see the witches and, like, new and improved Ankhmore Pork, I think. And, um,. I am super excited to see how that goes. I think he's evolved yeah, as a, like a great Phantom deal. Of the opera. Yeah, it's Phantom of the Opera. We're doing Phantom of the Opera. Um, I do think he's dipping really like in... Repo in this one. He's dipping into the same area that he reaches a lot with the witches, which is oh hey, stage and magic are very similar. Um, but this is his like final hurrah at it, and it's very interesting from that perspective. Because from this point on, the witches will not have, like, their own main book, right? Yeah. Yes. Carpe Jugulum. Oh! Carpe Jugulum. Carpe Jugulum. Oh! I was, I I was wrong. First <laughs> Masquerade. That one bangs. I don't think I've ever read Carpe Jugulum. We will... It's just, like, straight I, up? I, I mean, I haven't read either. I haven't read Masquerade either, so I'm excited. I'm excited God, for anything that's not this book. I can't believe we had to listen to this book twice. I'm gonna cry. Yeah, yeah I got I got yeah. COVID, team. That was my fault. Sorry about that. My oh. hours completely COVID. rejuggled. And you got COVID, and then your boyfriend came from the Netherlands. I love was... my boyfriend so yeah. much. Yeah. Oh, All right. He got I'm so normal. I cannot glass believe he wrote freedom. Feet of Clay and Hogfather in the same year. It's Damn. true. I mean, or that's Hulk that's one of those moments where you're like, this man is truly genius. Can you imagine writing two of some of the best books ever written in the same fucking year? I'm going to stop the recording. Everybody say goodbye to the listener. Okay, goodbye, yeah, listener. Goodbye, listeners. We'll be recording for Masquerade next, sometime in the next century or so. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I pro I can promise within the next century. And li I feel confident. In that. Listener, you you hate me it because makes it I'm better. Sound than like you. we're not going to do it in the next century. <laughs> century of the fruit bat. Swear to God, century of the fruit bat. It's gonna happen. Yeah. Um. Uh, good night, listener. Hey, listener. Or just mulch. I, th I think they've gone. I think it's just me now. They're so they're so much more drunk than I. I've also finished two drinks. I've moved on to a ginger vodka. I think after this I'll have a little gin. Got some cedar for a gin that could really benefit from some winter savory. Listener, you may be thinking to yourself, these vast fucking leftists call everything racist and everything bad. They've read in 19 fucking books now, and there's been something racist. 17 books now. In every single one. That's crazy. Nothing's that racist. How could you say this about such a great writer? I'm sorry, listener. That's just how it goes sometimes. Sometimes you really love the writing of a very old British man. And he's extremely British. He hasn't left a lot. 
And sometimes he says some fucked up shit about other people around the world, but he's still one of the best writers in the whole world. This is the unfortunate truth of reality. I don't know if the others will agree, so I'll just tell you that my favorite scene is this simple moment where Rincewind walks up a hill and he sees an uh, ox farmer holding a string, an ox string holder, which is referenced many times in the book. He says, Those two sides down there, they're fighting for you. Great kings and rebels saying what you should want and, and what you need. And all I can think about is, what do you want? And the oxen farmer sits and ponders in the slowness of the animal he keeps. And he says, I'd really like a longer string. And Rincewind runs off. And it's so funny because despite all of the issues and problems I have with this book, the very simple idea that people are often left out of the determination of their own lives by forces greater than themselves, it's very important and very powerful. And I appreciate that Terry would speak up for those things. And often he does valiantly. It is only that in this book he has failed. He's failed to recognize within himself the ways he thinks about East Asian people may contribute to dangerous ideas. Ideas that they are less than us, they want to be controlled, that they deserve to be controlled. That the only thing that can save them is ripping away their culture. That it is lesser than ours. This is where he fails. I do not think it is solely his fault. Though I think he could have avoided it. It is simply the reality of the world that he lived in, and which we live in, which so often teaches us that those things are true. Anyways, that was my serious moment, listener. <laughs>